Hi, good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited for you all to join us today uh, for Trauma Informed Awareness Day. To make sure that everything is running okay with our tech, real quick. There we go. So, thank you for joining us as we observe the uh, third annual Trauma Informed Awareness Day here in Illinois. Um, we're here today to honor the work that has been done around trauma informed care, while also advocating for the expansion of trauma informed services and policies. I'd like to thank the Illinois Children's Healthcare Foundation for their generous support that made this event possible. I'd also like to thank Representative Robin Gable and Senator Julie Morrison for sponsoring the House and Senate resolutions designating today as Trauma Informed Awareness Day in Illinois. Uh, I'm Bridget Gavigan. I'm the director of the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative. The collaborative is a program of the Health and Medicine Policy Research Group, a 40-year-old organization with a mission to challenge inequities in health and healthcare, and to promote social justice. If you're not familiar with ACEs, it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Uh, health and Medicine founded the ACEs Collaborative 10 years ago in response to overwhelming research demonstrating that the profound impact of our environments and experiences in childhood have on our health and well being throughout life. The collaborator's mission is to catalyze a movement to prevent trauma across the lifespan, promote thriving, and put the issue of trauma on the forefront of the equity agenda in Illinois. We do that through policy and advocacy through research translation and dissemination, and through our capacity building. So things like trainings, webinars, and individualized technical support to organizations and systems interested in being trauma-informed. We have such an exciting lineup of speakers and I'm so grateful we're able to join us and share their wisdom with us today, share their ideas and their vision for a trauma-informed Illinois. We are going to be joined by Secretary Grace Hall, the Department of Human Services in Illinois. Uh, we'll be joined by Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton um, and also Yaakov Delaney from the Lieutenant Governor's Office of um, Justice, Equity and Opportunity. Um, we may be joined, depending on how things are going in Springfield, by State Senator Julie Morrison, depending on you know, the calendar of the day. We have uh, Deputy Commissioner Matt Richards with the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, Octavia Tyson, also with the Chicago Department of Public Health, who will be moderating our panel later today. Uh, and Rosalia Salgado, the parent leader with uh, Power Pack Illinois Kofi. You're gonna hear much more about them and from them um, as the day goes on. We have a super packed agenda. Um, we're gonna kick off this event by releasing an action plan to address childhood adversity in Illinois that was developed over a nearly year long collaborative consensus building process with leaders from around the state. Um, we'll be joined uh, for some welcoming remarks from Secretary Ho. Um, and then we will hear from a panel of champions who are working to prevent trauma, promote healing and build resilience at the community, city and state levels. We're gonna close the session out with some next steps and opportunities to get involved in implementing the action plan. Uh, we are recording the session and we will share the link to the recording as well as any slides and materials that we discuss in a follow-up message. Um, because our agenda is so packed, we may not have time to answer questions that you all have live, but we will do our best to follow up with your questions after the event. We ask that you submit any questions for the panelists via the Q&A function. Um, so you can see that at the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A, that will be the best place for you to put questions for panelists so we know where to find them and follow up later. Uh, please use the chat function to alert us to any technical issues that you're having. So why are we here today? Why is it important to acknowledge trauma and recommit to promoting healing and building resilience in Illinois. 
trauma, which may include adverse childhood experiences and other experiences across the life course is quite common. Um, this is feeling especially true now for, for people as we deal with the life disruptions, loss, grief, health impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as well as, as we continue to see the need to respond aggressively to traumas per, uh, perpetuated through white supremacy, racism, and discrimination. Decades of research indicate that trauma impacts health and social outcomes, both daily and long-term making it more difficult for people to reach their potential and to participate fully in their communities. So our goal then is to reduce the frequency and impact of traumatic experiences, as well as to prevent their transmission to the next generation. The good news is that just as research tells us um, about the consequences of trauma, a growing body of evidence also demonstrates that there are many things that we can do in our communities in our workplaces, our hospitals, our schools, to prevent and mitigate against the harms of trauma. Positive supports and experiences, such as uh, stable and nurturing, rela nurturing relationships, equitable access to food, housing, healthcare, financial resources, and other fundamentals of lifelong health and well being can buffer against the effects of adversity and build resilience. So when the first Trauma-Informed Awareness Day was designated in Illinois in 2019, it was a call to action. State leaders were encouraged not just to become aware of the impacts of adverse childhood experiences and other potentially traumatic experiences, but to also implement policies and practices to prevent and address trauma. And this year, that call to action in the House and Senate resolutions speaks specifically to the importance of addressing racism and racial injustice. You cannot be a trauma-informed state without actively dismantling racist policies, practices, and systems. So it was with the same spirit of urgency and shared responsibility and action um, that you see articulated in the 2019 and 2021 resolutions that the collaborative convened a statewide working group in July 2020 to develop an action plan to address childhood adversity in Illinois. We really wanted to answer some of these questions. What does it mean to be a trauma-informed state? What strategic priorities should we emphasize? And how do we envision healing across Illinois today? The action plan was developed over a nearly year-long pr process. Um, we engaged in a number of tactics and strategies to um, identify um, what would be included in this action plan. So we conducted a national scan of ACEs and trauma-informed policies and state-level legislation across the country so that we can identify what are some promising approaches and opportunities for growth in Illinois. What can we learn from what other states and communities are doing? Uh, we convened the full statewide working group several times over the course of the year to coalesce around shared values and identify high level opportunities. We narrowed and refined the focus through surveys to the statewide working group. And we conducted focus groups with parent leaders from community organizing and family issues, our, our, our close partners at Kofi, to ensure that the plan reflected the priorities and expertise of community members. We convened subcommittees around the five focus areas that emerged in this process to refine the plan and to translate high level opportunities into specific action items. So what we are releasing for you all today is this action plan that outlines exactly what this process looks like um, and what our findings were as a group. Um, we will be sharing this action plan with you all as a follow-up uh, email to this presentation, and you'll be able to find it on Health and Medicine's website as well. I am going to just very quickly go through the highlights from the action plan. Um, and you know, when we come back together after our panel, our speakers and panel discussion, we'll talk about some next steps that we can uh, pursue together. So the statewide working group really honed in on five 
core planks for the plan. That we really think it's important if we're gonna be a trauma-informed state that we engage in trauma-informed policymaking. So how can we improve the design and implementation of public policies by applying trauma-informed principles, things like trust, transparency, safety, accountability, collaboration to the policymaking process itself. We want to improve our coordination at the state level. Um, we, we know that there are a lot of different state agencies, a lot of different coalitions that share some responsibility around um, addressing childhood adversity. And we think that there are opportunities for us to be more connected in the work that we're doing. So thinking about how our strategic planning, our policy and program design, our information and data sharing could be more cohesive um, and joined together so that we can have a comprehensive multi-generational approach to addressing childhood adversity in Illinois. We know we have to uh, continue to educate and build awareness and advocate for the importance of this work. Um, we want to continue to spread the word with policymakers, um, with business leaders, with healthcare professionals, educators, community members, the media, about why this is important, how it impacts them, um, what they can do about it, what does it look like, um, and how can they be involved. Improving data collection and accessibility. Um, we, we know we need to get a better understanding of what the full picture is related to trauma, healing, and resilience. We have some threads of that, um, but they aren't necessarily always connected. And so we want to map out what does the, the data collection um, process look like here in Illinois? What do we know about um, adversity and trauma and resilience? And what are the gaps that we need to be creative in figuring out how we can um, fill as we move forward. Um, we also want to make sure that Illinois residents have access to that data, that it's easy for people to find, that they know where to go. If they want to see what's happening in the state and in their community around it, indicators related to, you know, well-being and resilience and adversity, that there's somewhere they know they can go and that information will be um, accessible and understandable. And then we want to make sure that our data collection efforts themselves are trauma-informed. So what is the experience like for people who are participating in these surveys? Um, what happens if they are asked about potentially traumatizing um, information? Are there resources that are provided? Um, do they know how that information is gonna be used in their communities, uh, providing that kind of context? And then finally, identifying trauma-informed practice metrics. You know, we, we wanna have more clarity around what it means to identify as a trauma-informed organization or system or community. So can we identify some guideposts that can tell people where they are in that journey? And um, can we get some consistency around how we're measuring our progress? So these are the, the five planks that we really coalesced around. Um, I won't go into great detail around the specific strategies and action steps, um, but know for each plank that we identified, um, I shared the goals, but we have outlined the key challenges that emerged in our statewide working group discussion, um, the reasons essentially why we decided that these needed to be part of the action plan. Uh, we identified the high level strategies that we are going to pursue and then some specific action items within those strategies. So I want to take a second and just check in and see um, if uh, our other speakers have joined us yet. I believe they have. Um, so we are going to come back to the action plan and send and share some next steps and ways you can get involved at the end of the program. Um, but at this point, it is my great honor to introduce um, our next speaker for the day, um, the Secretary of the Illinois Department of Human Services, Grace Ho, has joined us this morning. Uh, Secretary Ho has served in this role under Governor Pritzker since uh, March of 2019, uh, where she advances the department's mission to strengthen Illinois by building up lives and communities through an integrated 
the network of mental health, substance use prevention and recovery, uh, and re rehabilitation, developmental disabilities, and family and community services. She has dedicated her career to advancing social justice by working in the nonprofit and public sectors for change through public policies, social service provision, community organizing, engagement, and philanthropy. And she has been a valued partner of health and medicines over the years, and we are so pleased to have her here today. Grace, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. It's such a pleasure. Um, to be with all of you um, this morning. I'm pleased to return as I joined the first annual Trauma Informed Awareness Day event just a few years ago. Um, at the Illinois Department of Human Services, we are fully committed to helping build a more resilient and just Illinois. Um, and this is a day to acknowledge the impacts of trauma and to commit to advancing policies and practices that prevent trauma, build resilience and promote healing and thriving. And we want you to know that the Department of Human Services is here with you and together we know that we can create a stronger Illinois um, and, and to lift up communities who need us most. So as many of you know, um, we put, the department puts food on the table of hungry families every day. We provide safe access to medical coverage to individuals, families and older adults. And we help people find pathways to employment, independence and recovery. And our work is done through our hospitals, offices, developmental centers, and it's also done in partnership with over 500 community providers across the state. And it is these organizations that lift up Illinois families each and every day. Further, our agency, the Illinois Department of Human Services, has committed to becoming an anti-racist organization. And we have developed a diversity, equity, inclusion, and racial justice implementation plan to strive towards that. The governor has been unwavering in his support of our efforts and has inspired us to do and to be better. And I'm so proud to be a part of his team. Communities have and continue to feel the deep impacts of racial injustices across the country. Um, and as many of you may know, earlier last year, we proudly launched Healing Illinois when Governor Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Stratton unveiled a five and a half million dollar initiative aimed at fostering dialogue and promoting racial healing in the state. This is a one of its kind by a state government initiative and was launched in partnership with the Chicago Community Trust. And we are very grateful for their leadership and partnership. These grants were awarded to organizations across the state to foster positive dialogue on race relations and deliberative reckoning on systemic racism and disparities still faced by black and brown Illinois residents. These state funded grants were available to organizations where that they used to pursue one of the four following activities. One, promoting dialogue. Two, encouraging, encouraging collaboration, um, uh, community murals, storytelling, performance events, racial justice campaigns, and also seeding connections, which involves activities that reaffirm the humanity in each of us and uplift what unites us rather than what divides us. Healing Illinois was an opportunity to recognize and understand our common humanity, acknowledge humankind and build trust amongst communities. To truly fight inequities and build a better, more inclusive Illinois, we have to be able to articulate the history of personal, institutional, and structural racism that got us here. And just as importantly, the modern iterations of personal, institutional, and structural racism that holds us back today. Additionally, here at the Department of Human Services, our Office of Community and Positive Youth Development funds a training and technical assistance partnership to work with youth service organizations and their sites to develop their capacity to ensure that program staff are served in trauma-informed environments and by trauma-informed staff. Every day, youth are exposed to violence in their homes, schools, and communities. And research has demonstrated that these young people are at increased risk for continued victimization, mental health concerns, substance use, suspensions from school, and involvement in the justice system. They're also at risk for long-term physical health issues. It is imperative that we as a state recognize the ill effects and unintended consequences and must be responsible to protect youth from engaging in situations 
or experiences that trigger trauma reactions or re-traumatize youth. We have an obligation to ensure that our efforts help these youth and families and are in fact not doing additional unintentional harm. To ensure the physical and emotional safety of these youth to build resilience and empowerment, to risk, risk, reduce risk and to facilitate positive growth and in development, we must use these best practices of science to ensure that our youth service system and our providers infuse and sustain trauma awareness, knowledge and skills to their organizations, cultures, practices, and policies. All youth should be served in a trauma-informed environment. Through our tech training and technical assistance provider partnership, we provide approximately 50 trainings each year. These trainings are planned in multiple locations across the state and have been held virtually over the past year as a result of COVID. We anticipate continuing this work in a virtual environment for a few months before returning to in-person sessions. These trainings, along with individualized technical assistance are intended to develop the capacity of youth serving organizations to become trauma informed. This is just another investment we are prioritizing. So on behalf of the Department of Human Services, over 13,000 people strong who make the lives of one in three people in Illinois better, it's such a pleasure to join you and to see a real difference being made. Thank you and have a great day. So much, Secretary Ho. We appreciate your, your time with us today. It's exciting to hear about all the great work that's happening in your department and in the state. Um, we are lucky to have a lot of advocates who are in charge of this uh, work in, um, in Illinois. Um, there's a lot of positive stuff that we can build on here. We know we have work to do, um, but we also know that there is really good work that we are, we are building upon. Um, so with that, um, I, I would now like to bring us to our leadership panel discussion. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the panel, Octavia Tyson. Octavia serves as the program manager for resiliency in communities after stress and trauma, known as RECAST, in the Chicago Department of Public Health's Office of Violence Prevention and Behavioral Health. Um, the purpose of RECAST is to promote resilience, support, and health in communities that, that face ongoing adversity. Um, Octavia and her role is super connected to the work that we're doing here today. Um, they provide citywide workshops in trauma-informed care and restorative justice and healing-centered engagement. Um, they establish trauma-informed policy and practice recommendations through a citywide toolkit, um, and they are increasing access to trauma-informed services. Um, Octavia is also a member of the statewide working group that help us develop the, the action plan. So we're, we're thrilled for her to moderate the, the panel. And I'm going to um, turn it over to you now, Octavia. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited to be here and to be moderating the panel. Um, so we're going to have the speakers answer a few questions um, or respond to some questions about 10 minutes each. And then we'll come back as a larger panel to really talk about lessons learned and perhaps some next steps um, from each of the panelists. Um, so our first uh, panelist that we have um, going first is going to be Matt Richards, who is the Deputy Commissioner of Behavioral Health here at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, Matt is a healthcare administrator with the LCSW and 10 years uh, progressively responsible experience in healthcare and clinical administration. As the deputy commissioner of behavior health, he oversees uh, CDPH's violence prevention, mental health, and substance use and recovery programs. He is also a lecturer at the University of Chicago in social work and public health. He has particular interest in crisis response, the integration of primary care and behavioral health care, evidence-based substance use disorder treatment, and harm reduction, as well as place-based approaches to mental health and community safety promotion. So I'll turn it over you, to you, Matt. So I'm going to be talking about um, supporting trauma-informed systems of care in Chicago. Um, the mayor 
uh, since she's taken office, this has been a major area of priority and we've seen really significant investments uh, at the health department, investments that we haven't historically seen um, to kind of fundamentally change some of our approaches around trauma responsiveness in the city of Chicago. Um, one of the big areas where we've been making investment is through the framework for mental health equity, which is the city's strategy for um, strengthening the mental health safety system. And so we really talk about creating a system of care where all persons can receive care, regardless of ability to pay health insurance status or immigration status. Um, one of the hallmark you know, investments that we've made this over the past year is that we funded 32 trauma-informed centers of care in communities of greatest need in the city of Chicago. So you'll see on this map, 34 community areas that are visualized in dark blue. These were communities that we prioritized on the basis of economic hardship, uh, percentage of adults who were uninsured, uh, community level violence exposure and trauma exposure, and rates of mental health crisis. And we created a composite index and then prioritized these communities on the basis of that data. Um, and I think that reflects our holistic understanding of what trauma is, that we understand trauma to be contextual, um, uh, that in any set of conditions that persistently make a person feel unsafe in the world uh, can, and I would argue should be understood to have the potential to be traumatizing. And so, uh, these 32 centers not only are receiving a, approximately $300,000 of funding per year over the next three years, but are really getting tailored uh, technical assistance from the health department and our partners to really go on a trauma responsiveness journey in their own setting that relates to how they deliver services, that relates to how they prepare staff to do this work, um, uh, and, and recognizes the, the ways in which trauma impacts human development and human experience. Uh, as I said, the mayor has tripled the city's mental health budget since, since starting, and so this has been one of our hallmark investments. We've also, um, uh, the CPS uh, announced their healing-centered framework just a few months ago, and, and, and part of this is really going to transform the way CPS approaches everything from doing uh, trauma audits of policy and procedures, training for staff, uh, clinical services in school. It was a really a holistic framework developed between CPS and Chicago Beyond, um, who some of you may be familiar with. And we're really exploring ways in which the health department and the investments we're making in the trauma-informed space clinically can partner and support those CPS strategies for kids. Um, we've launched a pretty significant telehealth program um, in the city, uh, and, and that was, of course, incredibly beneficial during the COVID uh, pandemic. We delivered over 17,000 units of service across our, our clinical settings uh, to folks during the pandemic to support them. We're growing team-based care, so I, we talk about a distinction between clinic-based care and team-based care teams that bring care to folks who often have more complex needs outside of brick and mortar settings. Um, and really one of the goals of that is to reduce cyclical utilization of emergency department services, of 911 services, um, uh, to reduce preventable contact with law enforcement and public safety systems. We're moving towards operationalizing a 211 system for the city of Chicago. Um, we talk also a lot, I think, in the public safety space on the city side. Part of our trauma-informed journey has been really rethinking ways in which we build and promote safety in communities. And so I'm going to give you one example of this, that we knew um, that we were seeing particular groups of residents that were having cyclical contact with the 911 system, uh, with, the, uh, with law enforcement systems, with the jail systems. Um, and, and we determined that if we were able to actually pilot this team-based care to deliver services to those folks in community, we could really interrupt that cyclical utilization, particularly when it's paired with housing. And so the, I, I provided two examples of us expanding team-based care models um, that are particularly um, adequate or, or good for people that are experiencing serious mental illness or co-occurring substance use disorders. 
We've also expanded mental health care uh, across all of the city shelters, um, homeless shelters, and across the CTA system for continuous riders. And we've already seen this sort of investment reducing the amount of 911 calls, reducing preventable contact with law enforcement, um, and getting folks connected to the services that they need in community. Um, one, uh, two more things I want to say. So one thing we're really excited about is the city is really rethinking, as many cities are, the way in which we approach crisis response from a more trauma responsive perspective. Um, moving away from responses that are primarily based on, you know, public safety response and moving more to a healthcare response and a social service response. Um, we're going to be embedding mental health professionals in the city's 911 call center starting this fall. We're going to be integrating healthcare professionals into our 911 response system starting this summer. And we're going to start piloting uh, trauma informed settings where patients, if they consent and are appropriate, can be transported or can self present for services as an alternative to emergency departments. We know that emergency departments are often not set up to support folks who are experiencing a crisis. Um, and we are really uh, excited about piloting this, this new approach, this new ecosystem for responding to folks in crisis in our city. And I think the trauma responsiveness, uh, expecting that these systems understand what trauma is, understand it holistically, understand the way that it can precipitate crisis, the way that it can be exacerbated and reiterated. Um, if we do not respond appropriately and supportively. Um, the last thing I'm going to say, uh, you know, we are, we really talk about being, being a healing centered city. Um, and there's a number of things we're piloting and have already started doing. We will have the city's first mental health awareness campaign launching this summer citywide. Um, that's really intended to build awareness about uh, trauma responsiveness. Um, we are uh, focusing on strengthening healing centered workplaces through a partnership with the Chicago Resiliency Network that we think employers have a really important role to play here and have a forthcoming RFP that's going to be supporting that work and, and really working with the state around developing a robust uh, Medicaid reform agenda uh, that is trauma engaged and trauma responsive. Um, look forward to engaging with the other panelists. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll answer any questions uh, well, later. Thank you, Matt. It's so exciting to hear about how the trauma informed is now being and healing and healing is being embedded within our programming, as well as the strategic planning. Um, particularly since the department began its trauma informed transformation some time ago, mostly in 2016, but definitely prior to that. So I'm going to shift a little, and we're going to um, move it over to L Lieutenant Governor Strat Stratton to talk to us about um, some of their efforts and the work that um, she's been doing in her office. Um, as an introduction, Lieutenant Governor Stratton is excited to serve as Illinois um, serve Illinois as the 48th Lieutenant Governor. As the first African American to hold this office, Stratton is passionate about equity and putting passion into government policy making. Her portfolio includes leading the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative and chairing the Illinois Council on Women and Girls, the Governor's Rural Office, Rural Affairs Council, the Military Economic Development Council, and the Illinois Rivers Coordinating Council. She is the chair of the R3 board, Restore, Reinvest, Reinvest Renew, and she co-chairs the Opiate Prevention and Recovery Steering Committee. Lieutenant Governor Stratton currently serves as the treasurer of the National Lieutenant Governors Association. Previously, Stratton represented the fifth district in the Illinois House of Representatives. Her first elected office was serving as chair of the Kenwood Academy Local School Council as a lifelong advocate for youth and creating safe spaces for our young people, Lieutenant Governor Stratton is a restorative, uh, restorative justice practitioner and trained peace circle keeper. She believes that where there is a void, we must take action to fill that need. Stratton was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, and she is a graduate of the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign and DePaul University's College of Law. 
She and her husband, Brian, live in Bronzeville community and have four daughters. So Lieutenant Governor Stein, we'll pass it over to you. Thank you for joining hey. us. Well, thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. And Octavia, thank you for that warm introduction and all of your leadership to Bridget and the Illinois ACES Response Collaborative. Thank you for the invitation to join you today. And I also want to acknowledge today's sponsor, Illinois uh, Children's Healthcare Foundation. And I would like to recognize all of the other voices that are contributing to today's dialogue that we're having around trauma today, Secretary Grace Ho of the Illinois Department of Human Services, Deputy Commissioner of Behavioral Health at the Chicago Department of Public Health, Matt Richards, and Rosalia Salgado, parent leader with Kofi. And of course, to everyone that's joining today's event, thank you for your interest and your energy in elevating this important work. So I want to begin my remarks today by speaking the name of George Floyd. You know, I'm thinking of his daughter, Gianna. I'm thinking of his family members. I'm thinking of all of the people who loved him and love him on this first anniversary of his death. I'm thinking about all of the trauma that we all have experienced over this past year since his death, and we've experienced it at different levels the trauma of ongoing racial injustice, the trauma of watching that video on repeat, those nine minutes and 29 seconds when Officer Derek Chauvin at the time put his knee into uh, George Floyd's neck and murdered him, a video that was shown over and over again on the news and social media. And even for those of us like me who said, I do not need to see uh, this uh, video, it was still very present. It was still talked about all the time. And it was something uh, that even if you tried to escape it, it was almost impossible to do so. It's the trauma of knowing that this morning when my husband, Brian and I, uh, started the day as we typically do and talk about sort of, um, you know, current events and, and what's happening in our world. And, and we reflected and paused to honor George Floyd. It's knowing that he said to me as my husband, the second gentleman of Illinois, that when he leaves the house, he never feels completely safe. That's trauma. And I recognize that over this past year that we all have experienced trauma. I have experienced this trauma, not just of George Floyd, but of Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others whose names that we don't have time to speak. You layer on top of that a global pandemic where there has been loss all around us, loss of life. Some of you even perhaps have lost family or friends and I, send my deepest condolences to you because I recognize the trauma of living through this, the grief, the loss of income some have experienced, some who for the first time have been hungry and experienced hunger and have had, or food insecurity and have had to um, address that issue. Young people who have been out of school and all of us being isolated one from another and not being able to have the connections that help us to heal from our trauma, Today, that's where I begin, by acknowledging my own trauma. Because to have these conversations, sometimes we get into them and we say, let's talk about it more from an academic sense, but really we have to come from it from a heart sense. And that's where I come from it. That's where my work as the Lieutenant Governor comes from, from thinking about the fact that as a restorative justice practitioner, we often say that hurt people hurt people, Right, So that's why we know that there's trauma because when you've experienced it, it often then leads to more trauma. But at the same time, healed people heal people. And Secretary Holt talked about our efforts here in Illinois to heal so that we can all have healed. When we're healed, we can heal our families and therefore our communities. So in restorative justice, of course, we talk about how we are aiming to restore repair the harm that has been done one to another, but also harm that's done by policies to entire communities, harm that is done in communities to other communities, individuals to other individuals, 
But we recognize that even government, as we think about the history of government, it has caused harm, right? Through policies and through um, the way that government has carried out its work. We've seen over time in housing and healthcare in education um, and in economic opportunity and workforce development in our environment. The reason why we fight for justice in these areas is because there has been so much injustice. So let me just talk very briefly about some of the things that we're doing in the office of the Lieutenant Governor to address some of the injustice that we see. And I'll begin by saying that early in our administration, Governor Pritzker established what's called the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative. And the goal of the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative, which is housed in my office and under the leadership of the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, and I know that Yaakov Delaney from my office, who is the director of the JEO, will be picking up from me because unfortunately due to scheduling challenges, I'm unable to stay for the entire time. But what I understand from the fact that justice, equity, and opportunity is we know that it is the lack of equity and opportunity and the trauma that therefore comes from that that is often why we don't have justice. And justice is not just about what happens with policing jails and prisons. Justice is about what happens in all of those things I mentioned before, the lack of access to quality health care, the lack of access to vaccines when you need it in a global pandemic, the lack of access to food or grocery stores or fresh produce in your community. All of these things lead to trauma, being told no over and over again, on the job uh, to when you're seeking a job, um, not having access to the ability to, to go to college or further your education because of the income and economic inequalities. All of these things to me cause, uh, cause harm and, and trauma. So at the office of the Lieutenant Governor through our Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative, I wanna share just a couple of the things that we are doing because just as I see trauma, I also see resilience. And resilience is evident in every single one of our communities. And while we can focus on the trauma, I also like to focus on the assets that are found in every single one of our communities and making sure that we can continue to do what we need to lift up the strengths and the gifts that are found in every community and not pathologize any community to make it seem like because of the trauma, there's no good that can come out of it. That's simply not true. So we did an Erickson with the partnership with the Erickson Institute. Um, we did a we created a special early childhood fellowship with a cohort of 23 leaders from various backgrounds to focus on childhood trauma. What happens in our government system when we those when we bring together those who have an influence on policy making to really think strategically about racial equity and how we can have positive outcomes for young children and families that have experienced trauma and to make sure that our systems are thinking intentionally so that we don't cause further harm. That is one of the things that we created in partnership with the McCormick Foundation and the uh, Erickson Institute to really look at how trauma impacts, impacts our youngest children and what can we do to change policies to make sure that that does not continue. Um, when I think about our Illinois Department of Corrections and our Prisoner Review Board, and I know Yaakov will talk more about this, but we established a special res uh, new restorative justice program that we're piloting uh, that brings restorative conferencing where people who have been harmed by violent crime and those who have committed harm through violent crime will come together in a healing space, in a safe space to really talk about what happened and the harm that has been done and taking accountability for that harm. That is one way that we can help heal from the trauma of violent uh, crime and harm and offenses. In our 21st century transformation model with the Department of Juvenile Justice, which disproportionately uh, uh, impacts black boys in particular and increasingly black girls, but black and brown children that are in our Department of Juvenile Justice, children that are often hundreds of miles away from their families and are experiencing the trauma of, first of all, being incarcerated, and then, which is traumatic in and of itself, and then on top of that, 
not being connected to their communities and their families. So we came together with the governor's office and the leadership of uh, Director Heidi Miller in our Department of Juvenile Justice. And our office is working on this, this 21st century model to really address the trauma that has been experienced by these young young people so that they can we can close down these large prison like facilities and create smaller more dorm like facilities that are closer to their homes closer to their families and um, with more trauma informed services and and more services that are going to be provided right in their own communities these are examples of the ways that we are working to use the justice equity and opportunity initiative to really do more and the last one that i will mention is our restore reinvest and renew program which invests 25 percent of the net cannabis revenues uh, adult use cannabis sales revenues back into the communities that have been most harmed and traumatized by the war on drugs and so this past january um, we put 31.5 million dollars in grants to community-based organizations so that they can work on issues such as violence prevention youth development civil legal aid um, re-entry services and economic development in, into these very communities that have suffered the most trauma and harm. And this investment is going to happen year after year because it's embedded right in the legislation. And I'm so proud to chair the R3 board. But in addition, I'm so proud of the fact that we have made this process as accessible and equitable as we can. We're not at 100%, but we're going to keep working on to build this program. And we have people who are directly impacted, harmed, and traumatized by the war on drugs and the, and the over-incarceration of their communities, justice-impacted individuals serving right alongside of me on this board. So that's an example of what we're doing in the office of the Lieutenant Governor. We're going to continue collaborating and con collaborating with and convening stakeholders to advance trauma informed pro uh, programs and policies. We look forward to working with all of you on this line and I hope that you'll reach out to me. If somebody from my team is on the line, if you can put our email address to reach me. Lieutenant Governor Stratton, LTGOV Stratton at Illinois.gov. I do have to leave for another commitment. I was honored to be a part of this event. And I want to thank everyone who's making a difference. I can't wait to hear about the outcome of what comes of this meeting today. And as I mentioned, my JEO director, Yaakov Delaney, is going to remain on the call and continue on this panel because I have to leave. But thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all you're doing to help heal our state. Thank you so much. So uh, someone did put it in the chat box, the um, email address. And if you all have any questions, please do include that in uh, the chat box. Madison, who is working our Zoom background, she'll be collecting all that information. I so appreciate you bringing in the anniversary of George Floyd as a part of these conversations. Um, a year ago, you know, we didn't really know his name. And now he became a hashtag. He um, serves as a catalyst for this um, racial injustice that we've been fighting against. But most importantly, it's a reminder that he was human and that part of Trauma Informed is about human rights as well. And so I appreciate you also mentioning the social justice aspects and that it must be a deep system change that looks at dismantling racism, including equity, and also looking at the human rights of us as a city, as people, as a state. So I appreciate your time and I will turn it over now. We'll um, hear for Ros Rosalia Salgado. Um, and so Rosalia serves as a parent leader for Power Pack Illinois, Power Pack Illinois with Kofi. Um, her and her husband and her two daughters, ages 11 and eight, live in, Hermos in the Hermosa community. She's a delegate of the Northwest branch of Power Pack Illinois um, Governing Council and represents her branch on Power Pack's Illinois Health, Food, and Recess campaign. Through Kofi, she is a parent peer trainer and an Illinois Scholar Solar for All ambassador, providing communities with information on renewable energy and um, an early learning ambassador providing families with information about the importance and location of early learning programs. Rosalia is a champion for trauma and an Illinois ACES response collaborative member. 
She is trained in SMC, Survivor Moms Companion, to support new mothers and mothers-to-be. The work she has done with peers has encouraged her to return to school to earn her GED. In her community, Rosalia is a member of HNA, Hermosa Neighborhood Association, where she participates in park cleanups and beat meetings. So Rosalia, we're excited to have you and to hear from you today. Thank you, Octavia. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, first and foremost, um, I will say that I would not be here sharing my experience without being a part of the amazing organization, uh, Kofi, which is um, Community Organizing Family Issues. Um, the training Kofi provided at my children's school a couple of years back um, really helped me with my leadership skills today. And it also provided me with a great group of people looking, finding a great group of people um, that have the same intentions, which is uh, providing positive changes for their children and their communities. Um, not only do these wonderful group of people uh, care about their own communities and are willing to change policies and practices, but they focus on other communities, all of Chicago, and most importantly, all of Illinois. So I am very humbled and very proud to be part of such a great organization. Um, what encouraged me to become a champion for trauma specifically is, um, the, is some of the trauma that has been part of my own family members in the past and even now. Um, it's a very important to me uh, that we find ways to break those chains that tend to get passed from generation to generation. Um, I know that there are some resources that were not provided for me and my family uh, when we needed them um, years ago, whether they were there, but we were not able to reach them or not able to find them. Um, it was still it was still difficult uh, for trauma to even be mentioned. So I find it very important um, for it to be mentioned now. We already know that children, families, and communities, especially in low income communities, have suffered from uh, mental health issues in the past uh, before this pandemic. Um, so I find it even more crucial and very much more important now that we provide these children with the help and the resources and the families uh, with the help and resources that they need so they can push their families forward and they can help their communities succeed. Um, every community and every child should have uh, the, the needs that they, that they deserve. Um, some of the ways that we are trying to advance these uh, policies and practices is simply by having these statewide ACES parent working group conversations. Uh, these conversations were crucial to um, the way we wanted to change a lot of these policies or move ahead with these policies. Um, being at a table with so many different people and different uh, opinions it really helps grow um, the policies or practices that we are trying to change. Um, also by sharing the information with other Kofi parents uh, we have come to find out that with Kofi with us, it's, it's somewhat like a family, which is an awesome thing. And what creates is creates a wonderful chain reaction where we all take these wonderful trainings and we get the opportunities to learn different things. And we just take those things and we pass them on to our own families and our own communities. And it spreads from there. Um, we have come to know that connection can be a very beautiful thing, creating connections with communities. It really does help pass on very important information. Um, I've also had the privilege of finishing my SMC training, which stands for Survivor Moms Companion. Uh, that will help me be the best companion that I can be for uh, mothers or mothers-to-be who are struggling or coping with trauma or mental health issues from the past or present, or even if they just need to look for a resource to help their family succeed or help them feel uh, more comfortable in their journey, uh, I will be there to be a companion. And I am very excited about that. And I am looking forward to that in the near future. Uh, just being trained to be uh, the best companion I can be means a lot to me, really. Um, as a parent ambassador, uh, we know there are many parent ambassadors in our organization, and we see when our communities need help. Um, we get told when the communities need certain resources, and that is very important to us to take that on and bring it back and try to change 
uh, those things going on in the communities. Um, that being said, we are actually talking about and possibly uh, talking about passing out flyers while we do our outreach this summer for early learning. So typically we knock on doors and we try to find the little ones to uh, give them and to parents of the little ones to give them information on early learning, uh, three and four year olds on, on development of early learning and sites that are around their communities where the children can attend. Um, so we wanna use that opportunity really to try to pass out some of these flyers. And um, these flyers will provide information on you know, what trauma can feel like or look like and how real it is and how, how much it is affecting our, in, our communities, especially our low income communities. Um, so we, it's really important that we use that opportunity to try to pass on as much information as we can so uh, parents and community members are educated. Uh, I find it very important that, that our communities are educated on what trauma is and how it can affect their children and uh, the rest of their community members. Um, so we are really hoping that we get the opportunity to uh, pass those flyers out and be able to get, uh, educate some of our families on that, um, about you know trauma, PSD, anxiety, any, any of those feelings that uh, maybe a lot of people are not familiar with, um, that would be extremely helpful, at least starting there. Um, I do think that um, in the future, I do think that equity is the most important thing for me uh, in the future with this work. Uh, communities being educated and having the resources that they need and they deserve for their families to succeed. Uh, it's extremely important for me. Um, in the future, continuing to spread the word on how trauma can affect uh, our children growing up and our families and our community members. Um, it takes a village to raise a child, right? So it's very important to me that everyone in the community knows what is happening with trauma um, and, and that everyone helps uh, spread the word on trauma and in trauma policies. Um, and also that it is never too late to ask for the help that you need and to get the help that you need. Um, I know many family members that are proof of that and I will continue advocating for them and for anyone, no matter what age, I find it extremely important for anyone to get the help that they need if they are experiencing any mental health or any trauma in their life. Um, I find it very important uh, that you get the help regardless of income, regardless of the community that you come from, uh, regardless of your status in the country. Uh, I find it that everyone deserves to have this, these resources within their communities, no matter what. Um, I see myself continuing to advocate for trauma in the future in any way that I possibly can. It, it's very important to me myself. Um, and I will piggyback on the Lieutenant government when she mentioned that we have to acknowledge our own traumas. And I find that very important. Um, so I know that having my family go through things and myself has continued to dedicate me to advocating for trauma in any way that I can. And I will continue to do so in the future in any possible way that I can. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalia, for that information. Um, we, I so appreciate your um, information about passing along information because so often trauma-informed stuff and naming mental health and all those things are held with professionals and those that do the work for others. But part of the healing process and part of us building awareness is that everyone needs to know and everyone needs to be able to identify what it is and how it shows up in their lives. Um, so we are going to go into our panel to ask um, one final question. Um, we don't have Senator uh, Julie Morrison on the call just yet, um, but she may pop in at some point. I just wanted to mention that um, Senator Morrison is the lead sponsor for the Senate uh, Trauma-Informed Awareness Day resolution um, for 2019 and 2021. And um, as part of this panel, the last question on our panel, we're gonna have uh, Yoko, Yaka, sorry, Delaney, who is the Director of Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative of the Office of Illinois um, with Lieutenant G Governor Julia Stratton join us. 
Um, he is a social justice advocate and restorative justice practitioner with lived experience um, in, in, sorry, with lived experience inside of the criminal justice system. During his time of incarceration, he obtained an associate's degree, um, a paralegal certificate, and various vocational certificates. He has also began advocating for prisoner rights and strategically researched solutions to remove systemic collateral consequences that were hindering formerly incarcerated people from becoming productive citizens. He is the founder of Breaking Cycles, a holistic trauma-informed support group model for justice system impacted people, as well as a founding member of People's Liberty Project, a group of justice system impacted people who use restorative justice mechanisms to build collective power. He's passionate about incorporating healing mechanisms to address debilitating effects of systemic trauma while zealously working to increase equitable opportunities for more marginalized people and communities. So at this time, if all of our panelists can come back on camera and we will just answer the question of what are some lessons learned that you can offer to other champions of trauma-informed um, that are interested in advancing trauma and responsive practices and policies within their systems, organizations, and communities. So why don't we start with um, Mr. Doing, if you can start us out. Thanks, Octavia. Um, yeah, and once again, I'm glad to be here with you all today. Um, I would offer what I believe to be like one of the most important lessons is to first um, listen to the needs of like the targeted population that you're seeking to provide trauma resolution for. Um, as we've heard in this discussion, trauma experiences occur in the childhood phase of many human beings and those impacted people learn like how to survive and exist with that trauma and sometimes aren't, are not even aware of it. What led me to begin a trauma-informed support group for justice impacted people was like sparked from listening to men and women whom I was assisting with legal barriers, um, talk about their trauma, but not consciously aware of how to identify that trauma in their life, nor how to resolve it. So as I was experiencing like my own re-entry process back into society, I began to realize there was a gap like in the reentry process to address trauma and childhood adversity. So I'm, I ponder like if the justice system, justice system impacted people who were returning back to their families and their communities were not provided uh, support nor resources to heal from their trauma, then it would be almost difficult for these men and women to have a productive transition. It would be difficult for them to maintain employment or housing or healthy relationships and most likely would, um, most would return back to prison. And so it was um, some of those initial conversations that allow for the space to build relationships which are so important that give people the confidence to be vulnerable in safe spaces. And so as Lieutenant Governor mentioned earlier, I'm excited that our Justice Equity Opportunity Initiative is working in collaboration with the Illinois Prison Review Board on a trauma-informed based restorative justice pilot, which is a first of its kind in the, on the Illinois state level that will allow, allow for a crime survivor to initiate a restorative dialogue with an incarcerated person that has been convicted of a violent act against them or to a family member. Um, at its core, this is a process that seeks to um, restore balance to all parties. It seeks to repair individual and systemic, um, systemic harm for the victim, for the person who caused the harm, and most importantly, like for families and communities, uh, these parties are connected to. And so um, just adding on, I, I think, as I said, I think, you know, one of the most important lessons is um, just being able to listen to 
first and foremost, the needs of that targeted population. And then, you know, you'll really figure out what that, what that population needs to address um, the, ha the, the trauma that they've um, like learned how to adapt and deal with for their entire lives. And thank, thank you again for, for having me here. Yeah, thank you. Matt, lessons learned? I think, you know, um, I think in the, you know, in the work that I've done, uh, a lot of my work has been in the substance use space um, and really seeing the interconnections between trauma and other areas uh, where we we often treat things in silos. And I think I wanted to echo what the Lieutenant Governor said. I think when you look at the way as a society that we generally respond to folks who have substance use disorders, it's very punitive um, and very uncaring. Um, and yet we know that there's this stark interconnection between uh, trauma exposure, feelings of persistent um, lack of safety in a person's life and risk of developing substance use disorders. I think for me, that was particularly personal because I grew up in a family with addiction myself. Um, and uh, it was certainly a form of adversity that shaped the person that I became as an adult. And so I think now in the role that I'm in, one of the things that I, I take very seriously is fighting for systems um, that recognize the ability of human beings to heal, that pull back from that impulse to punish, to not give people new opportunities, uh, to not imagine new spaces we can create um, where healing can happen. Um, and I, I, so I think there's a few lessons learned I would mention. One is being aware of your own trauma story um, and, and making sure that that's in the conversation. I think about it even in this conversation, you know, it, you know, others have shared their own, you know, trauma story. Um, and I, I think it, no matter what degrees you have or whatever, like you, you, that, that really um, is only part of the puzzle. It's, it's also knowing your own history I think a second thing is that the uh, trauma responsiveness journey never stops. So no matter what organization you're in, that box is never fully checked. So I think you have to hold yourself accountable that it's, it's an ongoing journey and really trying to see the interconnections between being, he being healing centered and lots of policy interventions that sometimes aren't thought to be connected to trauma. So I'll give you an example. When we're looking as uh, at the city at closing the black white life expectancy gap, which is our primary sort of North Star metric for our public, um, our public health plan. When you look at something like chronic disease, sometimes that gets that's a primary driver of that discrepancy, but we don't sometimes see the connections between trauma exposure and that that toxic stress is a primary driver of chronic disease risk when folks live in neighborhoods or um, you know, have that experience of being persistently unsafe, it puts someone at risk of developing a chronic disease. And yet we often don't name that. It's in the medical field, it's often, you know, we, we treat these very medicalized risk factors that don't acknowledge the interconnections with trauma. Um, uh, and I think the last thing I would say, and I, you know, I'm a social worker, so I think in these terms is that we are beings that are ecological, right? We emerge in an environment, in a context. And I think we always have to think about trauma engagement uh, ecologically, not individually. That's where like the attention to all the systems work is so important. Neighborhood reinvestment, um, criminal justice reform, uh, reimagining public safety. I think all of these systems level, the, the social safety net, um, folks have talked about, you know, when people's basic needs are not met. That's a trauma responsiveness issue. Um, and not just thinking about it in clinical terms. So I think those are some things that I would say I've learned in my work so far. Those are great points. I'll come back to you, Rosalia. 
Uh, what I would say uh, some of the great lessons learned is um, how it has been mentioned already before. It's um, just taking pride in, in knowing what you've been through and your own trauma. Um, I know that, that I've learned that lesson of myself, um, bringing myself up from anything that has been in the past. I have become a champion, and I know for a fact that um, I can continue to help other people become their own champion as well. That's a lesson that I have learned um, that I know that through your struggles, you learn and the chain can be broken and the chain, you know, can be broken and you can do something new. Um, that's a big lesson that I've learned. And I'm very proud of myself for advocating for something that um, I honestly maybe never thought that I can, you know, get out of, you know, uh, my own experiences to be able to help others. Um, but I have knowledge that I have, and I take much pride in that. Um, other lessons that I have learned as well doing this work is um, listening to everyone at the table, right? We get this wonderful table of different parents, of peers, of different people that come from different organizations. And I find it very important that absolutely everyone gets heard when it comes to these policies and practices. Everyone's opinion is very important. Um, I think that... Um, I also have continued to learn, I've learned this before, but it continues to amaze me how powerful parent engagement can be and how strong parent engagement can be. If parents and just community members all came together, uh, it would be a very powerful thing. Uh, so we are gonna continue to fight and advocate and look for more parents and more community members that want to engage so we can continue to change these policies and practices. Um, I think that, that that's what the relationships is very, are, are very important. Um, I also had a chance to engage with a lot of doctors and psychiatrists um, at some of these tables and some of these important collaborative meetings that took the time to put them, themselves in the situation of the parent, of the community member, of the community member from the low-income community. And that was greatly appreciated. Um, we know that sometimes, you know, community members or parents feel like they're they're at a different table they're in a different you know in a whole different way but it's but no there's times where now uh things are changing and now we're collaborating and it's an amazing thing where parents and community members are collaborating with these important psychiatrists and doctors from rush and you know all these other places and they're taking the time and we're taking the time to hear them and they're hearing us and I feel like if we continue with that that was a huge lesson for me because I feel like if we continue with that we can definitely continue to build those relationships and continue to make more policies and change policies that we do not agree with. Um, so that being said, basically, uh, I think that building relationships uh, and having relationships is what creates those great policies. And that's definitely a big lesson that I learned, just having uh, the great relationships and connections will continue to always uh, fix a policy or create a great policy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to, we have some audience questions coming in, but I also want to talk a little bit about the healing centered work around trauma informed. And so we've mentioned restorative practices um, quite a bit a couple of times in here. So if you could just maybe speak to why restorative practices belongs in the trauma informed space or vice versa and how it really contributes to a healing centered framework. Was that for me? I'm so sorry, I'll say that. That, that would be for, no, Mr. Delaney. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I would say um, it's important because as, as it's been mentioned before, most black and brown communities have experienced um, generational and systemic um, trauma that, st that originates from structural racism um, and so as we work on policies to address um, barriers that impact people on an economic level, the restorative justice practices are essential because um, people who have been oppressed, um, they experience that trauma and pass that trauma on generationally, uh, but you have mechanisms within RJ practices that 
specifically address um, healing, whether it's self-healing or whether it's, I think um, Rosalia mentioned, you know, building those relationships with others that have similar experiences and that are on the process of, of their own self-healing. And so as we begin to, to heal as, as people who are harmed, um, we heal others. And this is how communities are empowered. Um, you, know, you have the policies, that's one component, but people need to heal as well. Uh, and that's, I believe that's what restorative justice practices bring into um, the policy work. It brings the, the healing mechanisms that's, uh, that's essential for communities to empower themselves, as well as build relationships with um, governmental systems that have also caused um, harm and destruction and trauma to, to, those, to those oppressed and marginalized communities as well. Right, yes, I think uh, being uh, in circles is definitely a different way to have healing other than like seeing a therapist, but you have a way to have different supports and different um, people around you that you can be able to have your voice heard for that moment in that time. Um, so another question any of the panelists may answer. Um, we know that trauma informed has been on trend a little bit and that it is becoming more and more popular, if you will, in organizations and businesses and spaces. How or what are some plans or some thoughts around how do we continue to sustain the work as well as the messaging um, to keep trauma informed alive in moving so that it doesn't have a, a five year TikTok uh, lifespan to it? That was any panelists. I think about this a lot um, that I, I think on the one hand, I'm really glad that there's an increased public recognition of um, how trauma impacts human beings and that, you know, when any of us feels persistently unsafe, the way that that has the potential to change us. I think the worry, and I, and I think that recognition has the power to change systems if we let, if, if we use that uh, knowledge, that insight to, to build coalitions that require and demand those changes. Having said that, I do worry when something sort of enters the popular lexicon or whatever, and you hear a term being used a lot that it, I, I, I worry that sometimes it gets connected, it, it gets disconnected from the real substance of, we, of what we want to see happen. And so I think that's where um, within the life of uh, an organization or a system, there has to be that sort of um, emotional recognition of what we're talking about. Like we don't want it to feel like folks are just using language, but don't have sort of a personal experience of what that language means. Um, and I think one of the things I think about Trump being susceptible or vulnerable to trauma is it's on, uh, uh, you know, any person can conceivably experience trauma. There's certainly disproportionate impacts. We've talked about that today in terms of historically and systemically marginalized populations. But I also wonder about how do we, how do we help people on an emotional level um, understand how this work can kind of fundamentally change how you see almost everything. Um, and once you start seeing the world in that way, um, you know, that, that pivot of what happened to this person or what happened to me, it's hard to, for me, it's hard to unsee that. Once you start seeing the world through that prism, it's hard to not see the world through that prism. But I think, I, I think we have to make sure that folks on an individual, uh, on an emotional level feel that shift. Otherwise, you know, you worry that it's kind of going through the motions and checking a box. Uh, and, and, and you worry that it will become that like five year thing. So I, I think it's a great question. I don't have a perfect answer to it, I, but I think about it all the time, that question. 
Thank you, Max. Anyone else want to answer? Um, I would definitely agree with Matt, and um, I definitely just want to um, emphasize on how important it is to not hide it, like uh, it was mentioned. Um, it was def it's definitely out there, and I'm also happy that it's out there, um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I am happy that it's more out there because it was more, it was a little more hidden before, a little more, you know, um, you know, we all know that there are children in households that are told to not say what's going on or to not, and, the, and those things can be very difficult in how we move forward with this. So I honestly think that really getting out there and, and continuing to, uh, to build relationships, whether it's in the schools, uh, go, going to schools and giving, um, you know, parents um, maybe some classes about what is really going on, right? Like this is real. Um, we know that maybe some parents or maybe some community members think that, oh, that can't happen to me, right? So I feel that it's very important to expose uh, and, and, and not keep it under a rock for the next few years, um, to continue to expose it, to continue to pass out those flyers, to continue to talk about what is happening, to continue to ask people how they feel, right? Uh, people get caught up with materialistic things or everything that's going on now, other things, but it's very important. I find it very important for people to ask each other how they feel, their neighbors, the community members, the teachers at the schools, uh, principals, uh, anybody that is around your child. I find it extremely important to ask how they are, how they're feeling, and um, to get them the help that they need, even though they might be hurting deep down or in silence. That happens a lot. So I, I find it extremely important to continue to just uh, spread the word and to continue to let people know that this is very real and um, yeah, and, and continue to, to, like I said, the flyers, the, the door knocking, I'm really looking forward to that, honestly, because I find it so important to make that connection. So uh, I really think that that is going to help. Uh, setting up tables, you know what I mean? At, at different events um, and all these uh, uh, summer events that are going to be happening, I find that that is going to be extremely helpful this summer as well to passing on more of this information so it won't get lost and it would continue to be exposed so more and more people can ask for the help that they need for their children and themselves for their communities to succeed thank you thank you um it's so important that when people have the words to use and able to name it um, that we sometimes are more inclined to ask for help and to reach out um, as well as to connect um, I'm going to now get ready to pass it back to Bridget. Um, I just wanted to let you all know um, that if you're looking for more information on working with um, individuals who are um, incarcerated involved, then you can reach out to Yoko Delaney and he's got, I put his email in the chat box here. There was one question, Matt, um, how do people find out more about the um, responder initiative, the first responder positions? I'll put that, It's they're actually supposed to post today. So I will put my email um, in the chat box here. And uh, if you'd like to receive the uh, postings, please share in your networks. We're really looking to get you know a lot of um, uh, folks who are interested in doing this work. So it, we would really appreciate it. So I'll put that in the box right now, Octavia. Okay, great. All right, and then the rest of the other questions will be answered, including resources for um, those that have, uh, for the kids returning back to school and those that have uh, had experiences of losing someone to violence. Um, so we'll share some resources and supports for everyone as well. Great, so I'll hand it back over to Bridget for our closing remarks and next steps. Wonderful, thank you so much to uh, Octavia for moderating the panel and to our, our fabulous panelists. Um, it was both really inspiring to, to hear uh, what your plans are and what your vision is and, and, and really thought provoking to talk about some of your lessons learned. Um, we appreciate you sharing your, your expertise with us. We appreciate you sharing um, your kind of passion about this work with us and 
Um, just really looking forward to continuing to partner with you all um, in the days and months and, and years ahead as we as we take this on and, 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 and commit to not allowing this to be just some pop trend, right? We know how important this is. So we will um, continue to build, um, build together here in the state um, over the long term. Um, so I am going to um, share my screen just one more time um, for a couple of closing um, thoughts and and, um, and uh, ideas. So, um, you know, we talked about the action plan. I'm going to drop a link to the plan um, when I'm done talking into the chat box uh, where you can find it. But we are also going to send um, a copy of the action plan to you all in our follow up message. Um, I just want to reiterate that, that this action plan, it, this is not the Illinois ACES Collaborative's action plan, right? We, we see that this was built with shared leadership. Um, we had folks like Rosalia and Octavia um, all along the way with us um, developing this plan. Um, and we know that it's ambitious and it's going to take shared responsibility and shared leadership to implement um, this vision that we have outlined in the plan. Um, our next steps are going to be, you know, identifying some concrete implementation opportunities. We're going to be reaching out um, to all of our partners to really better understand, hey, we've laid out, you know, that trauma-informed policymaking is one of our planks. Where, where are you guys in the space? What are you doing? How do you, how do you want to be involved? How can you be involved? And really start mapping that out um, into something that goes from an action plan to an actual work plan. Um, we're disseminating this far and wide. Um, we want everyone to see themselves somewhere in this plan um, and to kind of take action. You, know, don't, you don't have to wait for anybody, right? If you see something in this action plan that sounds like something that you wanna do in your community, um, we hope that you will, you will take this as an inspiration and run with it. Um, we are gonna continue to seek input from the public, from policymakers, from other stakeholders to continue to refine this. We don't think that this is a, a, a plan that sits on the shelf and we never have to revisit our thinking around it. Um, we want this to be a living document that, we, that continues to evolve over time. Um, we'll be setting up at the collaborative some ways for us to map and track um, all the aligned activities and initiatives that we've identified within the plan. And we're going to be big on communicating um, in a two-sided way, right? Uh, um, what our progress is, what our opportunities are, and what are some of the barriers that we've, we've identified. Um, in the near term, uh, the best way for you guys to, to get involved in this work is to just shoot me an email, and I am going to collect all of that um, uh, information and find out, you know, figure out ways to keep you all involved um, in specific areas that you are most interested in. You know, we know not everybody is like super interested in data, right? So maybe that's not where you're going to be, but maybe you want to do public awareness. And so we're going to start figuring out um, how we can best engage you all in this work going forward. Um, with that, I, I just want to say one more time um, how much I appreciate um, all of our speakers here today um, who, who shared um, such valuable information and resources with us. Uh, we will be following up with um, answers and resources to some of the questions that came through in the Q&A during the presentations. Um, we'll be following up with the action plan. I'm going to share um, my slides and uh, Matt's slides as well um, with all the participants, and we'll be sharing a recording of this. So, you know, if you have folks who, who you think would benefit from hearing this conversation, I hope that you will share this recording with them when it's ready for you all. Um, and you know it's trauma-informed awareness day in Illinois. So um, hopefully you all are, are doing things to both take care of yourselves and to think about how you can engage in, in your community and, and build a more resilient Illinois um, and just Illinois together. I thank you all so much for your time. Um, we are gonna close this out now, but before I do, I will just go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen and add the link to the action plan into the chat. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.